Welcome to the desert of interstage window. My Saturday stream where I have a conversation with friends and today is our media episode. So we have Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. And today we're gonna talk about The Matrix. <laughs> okay. God, come on! You can be done with a bit. Oh my God. <laughs> All right, guys. All right. <laughs> Uh, we haven't let's... been replaced by AI. <laughs> <laughs> Kay loves your glasses, Landon. <laughs> Thank you. They're so cute. And they're also broken. <laughs> I, I was saying kind of before we started, because I told Landon, I said, I want to do a bit, bring sunglasses. The best sunglasses I have have rhinestones on the side. And the best sunglasses Landon has are bright pink, which um, don't match the matrix at all. But <laughs> I changed my shirt it shows our aesthetic for this, though. <laughs> Yes. And I just the so before we kind of um, switch over and show you guys the PowerPoint, I just want to say, like, one of my favorite things in the Matrix is how much they use sunglasses. And like, in my imagination, in my imagination, the producers probably pulled the Wachowskis aside multiple times and were like, okay, I know you love sunglasses. Um, I get it. I really do. But can we like have less? Can you give me like just one, just one more scene with no sunglasses? You can put sunglasses on Mr. Smith all you want. That is totally fine. But like, can we just take them off Keanu Reeves a little bit more? Like we can't, we can't see his eyes. Okay. Like um, we can't see Morpheus emote. So like, just, just give me one more scene without sunglasses. Just one. I mean, I have no evidence that this happened, but like in my mind, this definitely happened. <laughs> think that they were being sponsored by some obscure like sunscreen or not sunscreen sunglasses brand that they were just like <laughs> the matrix sponsored <laughs> by ray-bans <laughs> honestly yes that it was just like listen just to see how much you could get away with it okay where it, it, it goes directly into your pocket and it doesn't have to go through the producers or anything it goes directly to you <laughs> I just think I just think for the Wachowskis sunglasses is like shorthand for like cool it's just, it's just like, cause everyone oh, yeah. in this movie is rocking some it, like bomb ass sunglasses. I watched because uh, we haven't really introduced this yet, but this is my first time watching the matrix. Uh, I watched the birth of a meme I now understand. I'm like, <laughs> wow, sunglasses are cool only because of this movie. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'm convinced they weren't cool before this movie. This movie made them cool. And then because this movie made them cool in such an outrageous way, it became a meme. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think, I think before, before the, when you watch this, um, you didn't realize just how many memes that you had seen actually were birthed in the Matrix. Matrix has a lot of like the red pill, blue pill thing. Yep. Very Me memeable. Very memeable. Um, incredibly memeable movie but yeah so that's what we're going to talk about today we're going to talk about the matrix um now i am um, a lover of the matrix i saw it when it first came out in the theaters i didn't even know what i was walking into it was kind of like this movie um that my mom saw a review of and she was like oh i think we would really like this movie and so um, um the whole family went and saw the matrix and my child mind was just it was just blown it's like pow, 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 pow. i was like <gasps> You know, I mean, and I didn't have the words to articulate it at the time, but it like introduced me to the idea that free will was way more complicated than I had thought of it before. And I just, it had just never occurred to me to think about this. I mean, obviously I was like a little kid, right? And it, I, it impacted me so much that I went to see that movie, no lie, like six times in the theaters. The theaters were way cheaper back in the day. So it's not as much of a commitment as it might sound, but I had to take every single one of my friends to that movie. I take every single one of my friends and blow their minds too. And I remember one friend in particular, after the movie, she was like, Karen, you know, I really didn't get it. I really didn't get it. And um, suffice it to say, uh, we weren't friends for much longer, not because of the Matrix, but just, it was just like, it was the beginning of the end of that friendship. Let me just say that. <laughs> I, I feel I feel the weight of our friendship on this entire series. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'm just like, Aren't, isn't it so cool? Isn't it so great? And I'm just like, it's so yeah, great. Karen, it's great. If I don't say that, <laughs> no, no. But it is. But at the time, I'm, if at, at the oh. time being a child in in uh, in like the year you know 1999, it just like I mean, just like mind blowing, yeah. absolutely mind blowing. It was absolutely fantastic, and it's a, and it's yeah. a great. It's a really good movie. Like yeah. And I was I was trying to write the summary for this, and I'm like, I have to be so vague because there is so much that happens that is vital that you can't say all of it 
Yeah. Like that. And then we'll talk about that as far as like when, how much like this movie differs from other movies and what, what makes this movie so great, but it's like, wow, every single moment is vital to the movie. It's tight. It's a real tight movie. And I love a real tight movie. And it's real good. Like the writing, Mm -hmm. it's, it's like tight and also necessary and well-written, which is a a trio of things you never find anymore. (laughs) Yeah, good writing. What's that in 2021? Oh, holy crap. When I see what? a well-written movie, my mind is blown now. <laughs> really is. But yeah, but we're going to get on get into all of that. So, if you have if you have seen The Matrix before, strap in. Um, you know, if you were as obsessed as I was, it's going to be really fun. If you haven't seen The Matrix before though, uh, we're going to give you the primer and um and then you'll kind of know what it's about when the new one comes out at the end of the month. Yep. I remember a time where every edgy boy was obsessed with Mr. Smith virus monologue. That monologue is still holds up to today. It is an excellent monologue. Okay. Excellent monologue. Um, we're going to talk more about Mr. Smith next week, actually, when we talk about the sequels, um, cause he gets way more interesting in the sequels, but, uh, that monologue still gives me chills to this day. Okay. It still speaks to me. So I've been told also just as an FYI, I still haven't seen the sequels yet. So be careful with your spoilers in the chat or you can spoil it for me. I don't care. <laughs> but Karen, Karen might bite your head off because she has been very careful not to spoil it for me. So just yeah, so if Karen we, might kill you for spoiling it for me, I'm fine with it. If we could, <laughs> if we could try not to spoil Landon, I mean, I don't think it's going to mess up the movie for her um, because the sequels. Those of you that have seen the sequels, like you know, you know, but um, <laughs> but it's you know, it's not the same as the original. It's not like this beautiful tight story like the the first Matrix is. So anyway, if you accidentally spoil her, I'm not going to bite your head off. But if you could, please try not to. But yeah, welcome in, Kitty. Welcome in, Kitty. Happy to have you here today. Um, have, uh, Kitty, have you seen The Matrix? Um, count how many drinks Landon has. Okay, we will. We will. <laughs> that was me. I'm just like, we we got to we gotta try that. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know exactly what you mean, Kate. Um, don't worry. We're going to talk. We're going to touch on a little bit of that this week, but we're going to talk a lot more about that next week. So make sure you're here next week. Uh, we'll, we'll talk all about all that. <laughs> I can never spoil Landon. She's the freshest. True. Okay. Let's get this started, Landon. Let's get this started. <laughs> all right. Let's start we, where we start every week with our favorite things. Karen, I know you love this movie. Front to back. Second one to the last second of the two and a half hour movie. But what is your favorite thing? Oh my gosh. It's so true. I love everything about this movie. But what I chose... For my favorite thing is mouse, okay? Mouse is the best. If you hate mouse, I'm sorry. I don't understand you. He is just living his best, most authentic, horniest life. And what is not to love about that? I feel very in touch with my inner mouse, okay? I feel like I am constantly writing and role-playing my version of the woman in the red dress. So um, mouse speaks to me. And it's and he spoke to me as a child too in a way none of the other characters really did. I feel like Mouse was in this movie for child and teenager me who could just not stop being so goddamn horny all the time, and it's just perfect. It's just perfect. And I feel like and I feel like this and the sequels get hornier. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. But to me, in in this character, the Wachowskis are are putting forth all of their their horny teenage energy they're like hmm what was i like when i was 15 this this is this is how we were when we were 15. that's what the wachowskis are saying with mouse and i absolutely love him um it's tragic you know it's tragic poor mouse uh he doesn't get to to survive to the sequels um unfortunately but uh but i love him and uh, and he holds a special place in my heart and and his little his tasty wheat thing they're all like annoyed with him they're all annoyed with him he's going on about what tasty wheat tastes like let mouse live okay it's funny he's it's funny the tasty wheat thing is funny y'all lay off him you're annoyed i'm not annoyed he's amazing that's it i have a soft spot in my heart for annoying things by the way also (laughs) that's why she loves me it's true Um... <laughs> it was too good it was too good i just had to keep going was, i just had to keep going i did the so bit good. too long i shouldn't have spoken it's just like one of those things where it's like you're not supposed to agree with the self-deprecating <laughs> jokes um i went too long i went too long i'm sorry <laughs> no but i was gonna say a i think we're all mouse us our our peers who are just too horny for our own good uh we, we are all mouse or all have been mouse also mm-hmm. i do believe 
that Mouse was necessary to keep the realism of this world because I don't think it would have been a post-apocalyptic sort of feel or world mm -hmm. without the horny character who's like designing women to fool other men. <laughs> like it just, it wouldn't be real. I don't think the, I don't think it would have, I would have not been able to believe it. <laughs> Mouse does, Mouse keeps it real. Mouse keeps it really real. Mouse keeps it very real. Yeah, so he's my favorite thing when it comes to this movie. But Landon, what is your favorite thing? I love me. A wise old psychic. Uh, especially when that wise old psychic is played by a badass black woman. <laughs> oh my gosh, she's so good. She's so, so good. good in this movie. I do not know this actress. She is brilliant. Um, but the Oracle, like the writing of the Oracle in general was just so good. And that scene was just so like... I know that they they blew it up to expect like it was going to be this whole like weird metaphysical sort of thing like that there was going to be very psychic -y. I mean she's called the oracle and when you and when you approach like the common audience with the idea of what an oracle is you have a certain thing in mind and then there is this woman who has children with weird freaky psychic powers in her living room just cooking dinner at a 90s like you know 90s kitchen and just sitting there and like giving it real and just sitting there and being like, you don't, you know, you know the answer to this question you're asking me. Um, she's grandma. She's everybody's she's grandma. Just, okay. She's just Southern. So she's a Southern good. grandma. She, she really is that Southern grandma feel, um, which I fucking love. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to have the cookies baked by the Oracle. I really, really do. <laughs> I feel like there would be some psychic shit in those cookies mm -hmm. that I would need uh and she she'd also know like what kind of cookies you really want because she would know that but no in in general I also just feel like it was a fantastic scene all together where she's where like she's like don't worry about the vase and then he goes and breaks the vase and she's like now you're really gonna walk away with wondering whether or not if I had not said anything you would ever broken the vase in the first place yeah. and I'm like that's just such a well-written documentation it's it's so good it's so beautiful uh, she was my favorite thing and that was I that was a glorious scene to watch and I loved it and I am told that I will get more oracle content or at least information about how the oracle will exist in the sequels yeah so I am looking forward to that as well mm -hmm. yep there is more oracle coming in the in the sequels you will learn a lot more about her unfortunately this actress did pass away before the movies were finished so she's there there's part some she's in the sequels a little bit but there's also another actress playing the oracle in the sequels because she didn't get to film all of the scenes before she passed away um very very tragic her performance i think is one of the standout performances of the matrix trilogy among several excellent performances um but hers is particularly good the particularly acting. good the acting in the mm -hmm. series is fantastic mm -hmm. yeah so. yeah All great right. charisma i agree kitty kitty she's just she's fantastic fantastic yeah. all right shall we move on to the summary yes okay so um as usual for those uh that have not seen what we're talking about or it's been a long time since they've seen it which i think is probably for the matrix where most of you guys fall it's probably been a really long time since you have seen the matrix so we want to catch you up make sure that you know um what happened in the matrix that so you remember it so landon has written us a a beautiful little summary that um she's going to explain to you all of the important <sighs> events of the matrix i'm going to try like i said before every single second of this movie seems important so uh i did not write the entire plot or the entire <laughs> script uh, but uh we start out with a badass runaway scene from a seemingly female protagonist who's kicking ass uh ends up in a telephone booth and disappears out of nowhere as men in suits exit a dump truck curious as to where she went next we run into neo an everyday computer programmer that is on the precipice of wondering what the meaning of his life is it is then that he receives a mysterious call from the female voice telling him to follow a white rabbit and have all of his answers all of his questions answered and into wonderland neo goes uh it turns out that morpheus an elusive figure considered to be one of the most dangerous men alive, can answer these questions. 
but what Morpheus leads to is more questions than answers. Uh, he offers he offers Neo the chance to have the answers that he has been seeking with just a few leaps of faith, one literally off of a building that Neo does not take. And uh, it all leads to what the most important question of all is. What is the matrix and do you have a choice? It turns out that we are the matrix. AI took the world over hundreds of years ago and is now feasting off the power of human bodies as batteries. The trio, Morpheus, uh, Morpheus, Neo, and Trinity, and some others are fighting to keep the AI at bay as the people are trapped and unaware. They fight brutal battles and uh, their lives, oops, sorry. Uh, of the, they fight their brutal battles of their lives against a variety of viciously intelligent secret agents, including Mr. Smith with their ever so fashionable sunglasses. It is then review, revealed that Morpheus informs Neo that he is the chosen one, the reincarnation of the original man to break the matrix for the first time, and he is set to do it again to free them all, even if he, Neo, and the Oracle don't believe this to be true. But Morpheus's faith ends up getting him trapped, and Neo and Trinity must now free him from this agents. In the end, they were, they were successful in their, in their freedom, but betrayal will lead to death and tragedy. Uh, and at the very end, Neo comes into his own, once again dying. But what he really needed was the power of a beautiful woman to believe in him and to tap into the power of the code as Neo reborn as the chosen one. And that's where we leave off the first movie, basically. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Free will, true love, choices Daddy, all of my favorite things all of my favorite things it was really <laughs> all of the favorite things no and it was like and just so many beautiful easter eggs and like i said so many like little like i didn't even include in here i was rereading it i was like oh the red blue the red pill and blue pill of like mm -hmm. choosing do you want to stay blissful or do you want to actually get information and mm -hmm. all of that so and we're going to talk about some of this stuff, but there are a few things in the Matrix that other, um, you know, content creators have beat to death, like the red pill, blue pill stuff. So we're actually not going to go super in depth um, into into certain things that other people have talked about. We're not going to go super in depth into the trans metaphors of the Matrix because, again, other people have already done it. I'm not. We're not adding anything new to that conversation. So we're going to really be talking about more about the the context and history and the zeitgeist of what. Um, of what brought about the matrix and we're going to talk about the the philosophy behind it because I do feel like there's some things that um, that we can add to the conversation that are a little bit different but yeah those two topics the the red pill and blue pill and how those are seen today and also um, transness in the matrix other youtubers have already done and I know I can't do it better so um, so we're, we're only going to touch on those briefly yes. um, so yeah but yeah that's what happens in the matrix uh, excellent movie it's a very excellent movie. And Jed does ask a very important question that I think we should get into before we break into anything, because I think it's just interesting. Do we believe in destiny? Oh. oh. Uh, it's philosophical. Um, I think I am in, in line with Neo's thinking as far as uh, the, the choice of free will as much as possible. Mm. I suppose um, I do not believe in destiny, but I believe in manifestation. I do believe that the key to getting what you want and seeing your success is your ability to hold a thought that of what you want to do in your mind for as long as possible until you actually go do it. Like I believe in manifesting in the way of like, I wake up in the morning and I say to myself, today is stream day. Um, I need to do this, this, and this to make sure that I'm ready for stream. And I hold that thought in my head and then I go do it, right? Um, so I believe in in the virtues of patience and persistence and manifestation. And, um, and in that way, I do believe that I create my own destiny to some extent. Now, unfortunately, we are trapped in a system much like the matrix so you got to have um reasonable expectations of yourself there are lots of areas of life that you do not have control over and um and that is that is very true and so that's that's where i fall in in my thoughts on destiny um 
as far as as that goes i'm pretty sure i'm neo mm, probably I'm just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. um <laughs> <laughs> okay i wish if i could simply wake up in the morning and think like i am a billionaire now and make that happen you better believe i'd be thinking that thought all the time <laughs> oh it was kitty kitty made a joke yesterday uh talking to her and she was like there was, she made a joke that my next book uh, after i make a million dollars should be called like uh how money changed me uh and how it's not so bad and i was like mm, this is this is what i am waking up for i'm thinking that is my first thought every single Love morning it. when i wake up and i will manifest that money i want um, it yeah <laughs> that is I, welcome to costco i love you i like money <laughs> <laughs> all right but yeah okay well let's get into it um great question jed thank you okay so the context and history of the matrix i was there i lived it okay if you were a millennial you probably did too if you're closer to the zoomer side you might not have um so yeah this is this is we really thought we really thought truly that when the year 2000 rolled around like half the world's computers would just like suddenly explode and quit working that like um you know nuclear missiles were going to fire on their own uh all of our all the internet was not going to work because all of the servers were going to go down like we really really thought this stuff and my mom um some of y'all that are longtime viewers know she was a nuclear engineer by trade when uh when i was a kid right and so uh she actually had to work a lot of extra hours to go and make sure that their nuclear power plant was y2k compliant uh i don't remember what department she was in during y2k so i don't i don't know exactly what she did but i remember she had to work a ton of extra hours because of y2k like it was it was legitimate we really thought the computers were going to take over and then this movie comes out where the computers took over i mean you can imagine how everyone was like yeah duh oh my god what yes like it, it when you sat in this movie like it felt so real it felt like wow this could really happen this really could be our future and it was largely because like we all couldn't stop thinking about how the computers were just gonna like literally explode in like a few months you know now obviously y2k came and went that didn't happen but it was due to lots and lots of man hours from people like my mom going in and working extra hours to make sure everything was y2k compliant right so we did avoid the crisis uh but we really thought that it could happen and there was a there was a real threat there that really all of our computers computers were going to die and a whole bunch of systems were just going to shut down for a while. Like we really thought that it really could have happened. So that's the environment that the matrix came out in. That's so funny. I was very young <laughs> when it happened. I remember we were, it was new year's uh, and we went to this remote place in Maine. Uh, and uh, the only memory of anything Y2K related I have is that the clock struck midnight and the radios didn't turn off. So my mom's like, guess it's not happening <laughs> and that is the only y2k memory at all that i have <laughs> so i'm just like cool the radio kept working and that's what until like this movie and until you explained the context that is what i thought like y2k was i like oh did God. not think it was actually that big of a deal <laughs> Portland. Well, you were you were still pretty young at the time, so it probably like probably it was all happening around you. But oh, yeah. there's no way it didn't register. Like you didn't you were like, oh, the computers are going to be dead. But it, there's no context of what that even means. I was for a six small, year old. I was a small, very tiny bean. Yes, yeah. I did not remember. <laughs> Um, but I also knew Keanu Reeves was going to liberate me and I was fine with it. Hey, that actually did came to pass. You know, Keanu Reeves is excellent and um, an excellent motivational speaker. I'm just saying. And, and continues to be excellent. Like, let's yeah. just, we can turn into Keanu Reeves fangirls for 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, he donates a shit ton of money to charity every year. Like, yep. a yep. shit ton. Like, most of his royalties. Um, it's just, he's he's a decent human being and I yep. appreciate that in Hollywood. <laughs> And everyone he works with, he buys amazing gifts, which this is actually a great segue oh, yeah. into the next little bit that we wanted to talk about here. Um, I think this is from The Matrix, but it might have been from another movie. But he actually purchased um, a bunch of motorcycles for for like the whole uh, special effects crew, I want to say on, on one of The Matrix movies. Um, and he yeah. does that type of stuff regularly. And he doesn't publicize it and he doesn't want it publicized because he doesn't want it to turn into like a money making scheme for him where he spends the money on these people and then it makes more money for him. Like it literally is just like him saying, I have more money than I can spend. 
I'm going to do things for other people that are not paid as much as actors are. Yeah. And he just does this regularly. Well, and he also and- like demands, like I think there was a movie a few years ago where he took a pay cut to make sure, I think it was sound, it was either sound or special effects, but to make sure that they were being paid fairly because mm-hmm. there was like a whole issue with that too. Uh, and he didn't feel that they were being paid enough. And he was both, he was also a producer at that point. I think he was the actor and a producer in that movie because that's just where he's at right now. Um, and it was like, oh, this is awesome because you see that a little bit when actors get big, but not to the extent and certainly not for crew. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's certainly really for other actors crew. that they do that for. Mm-hmm. Jed coming in with the first, finally. <laughs> <Jed>! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but Keanu Reeves cre- correctly realized that the Matrix would not have been possible if it weren't for the effects crew and and that was shown like back in um back in the year 2000 uh popular movies actually won awards believe it or not i know they they won oscars uh, amazing can't imagine that in in this year and oh. and the matrix won several it won uh visual effects sound effects sound editing and visual editing so it won four it basically swept all of the editing and effects uh, awards for the most part, all the big ones. And 1999 was an amazing year for movies. So it was spectacular that The Matrix was able to do this. Just like I, I made a note here of like movies I could think of off the top of my head that came out in 1999. And here's like the list I came up with. Blair Witch Project, Green Mile, Sixth Sense, American Beauty, Eyes Wide Shut, Fight Club. And that's just like what I could think of in like 10 minutes of jotting things down. Yeah. An amazing year for movies. So the fact that Matrix walked away with for Oscars is just like mind blowing. It's also like fantastic when you look at the movies as a whole to to see the theme of it. Like the theme of the similarities as far as like Matrix go and Flight and Fight Club go, thematically have a lot of things in common. Oh yeah, uh, it's just interesting to see. Like you can tell where society is, especially back then when it was popular movies winning Oscars and awards you can see where the undertones of society are and what people considered important. Um, mm-hmm. Just, I, it like blew my mind when you told me that Fight Club came out the same year. Cause I was like, that's a, that's a huge contender. Mm-hmm. Um, Green Mile and, as well. Green Mile is, Green Mile, a, yeah, is absolutely. an excellent movie. I mean, and so is Blair Witch Project. Like not going to lie. Like that is, that is a day horror movie right there. Yeah. Uh, that, that changed the genre of horror. Yeah, so it yeah. no it's it was fantastic um and it's it's a great movie and there's reason why it is a contender mm-hmm. um and i w- i wish more movies i know more movies after the matrix started being built like the matrix but i wish that theme continued rather than big blockbuster action movies that we have now but we'll get there in a second sorry <laughs> yeah. keep getting ahead of myself yeah, no, uh, it's true. It's true. Uh, movies are the movie industry is not what it was in 1999, and it's kind of funny. Like the Matrix comes out in in the, in this in this era, and it says, you know, oh, we made the Matrix at the height of your civilization. And I don't know. I kind of feel like that's kind of true. Like I feel like kind of, things kind of went downhill in a lot of ways since then. Um, now, not everything. There's a lot of reasons not to go back to, to the year 2000, but there's a lot of things that were better in the year 2000. I'm, sure. As someone who's lived through all of it, it, it's just, you know, it's true. <laughs> That's just history for every up. We have to have a down. True. It just so happens that we peaked in 2000 and we're down at the bottom here at 2021. <laughs> 2040 is our year, bitches. <laughs> If you say so, I'll, I'll I'll try. I'll think about it. Um, hopefully manifest. Matrix it. <laughs> thirteen will be out by then, and it'll be awesome. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see if the Matrix Four is any good. Um, we'll find out. But yeah, so it was it was an award winner. Like it was considered both a popular blockbuster and um and uh you know high brow awards contender both. And there was many movies like this in that year, and and it was it was one of one of many. Um, excellent year for movies. So yeah, that's that. And then um, the other thing in regards to The Matrix that we want to talk about is some key influences. So I also want to mention here that um, if you go back and watch The Matrix when you've not seen it before, uh, like Landon did, uh, you'll notice a lot of the fight choreo looks very familiar. (laughs) This is because it was done by um, Yunwu Ping, who is the same guy that has done a lot of fight choreo, in particular for Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Anytime you see like, quote unquote, wire foo, it's either him or someone copying him. She's like, 
it will look very familiar. And I'm like, not never for, but seen not any for, of these movies. <laughs> But you haven't seen those either. But for people that that maybe have watched that are maybe kung fu fans, it's going to look very, very familiar. And pretty much after The Matrix, everyone that wanted to have something that that looked kung fu style or vaguely Asian style um, did this, including a lot of actual Asian movies that were like, oh, this is very cool. Yun Wu Ping, please do our movie, too. Or, hey, Corio, can you please copy Young Yun Wu Ping? He's excellent. You know, are you OK, Landon? <laughs> He's dying. It's fine. <laughs> Don't die. Sorry, um, I but, <laughs> but The Matrix is excellent, partly because it does what all um, of my favorite art does, where it takes little bits of all of these excellent things and it compiles them into this soup that is new and beautiful on its own. And the influences on the matrix are vast, but I wanna just talk about a couple of big ones. Um, there's, there's more than just, I'm gonna mention three, there's more. So just know if I missed your favorite, I know, but I didn't want to talk forever about influences. So I picked the big the big three, at least the ones that I think are the big three. And the first one is The Neuromancer, uh, which is a book. It is about, um, it's a, it's basically a cyberpunk book. If you, if you think about cyberpunk as a literary genre, um, The Neuromancer is probably what people will cite to you as like the quintessential um, cyberpunk book. It has a very similar plot about hacking, but what Matrix really pulls in from Neuromancer is the two main characters whose names are, I'm just checking my notes, uh, Case and Molly. Basically, Case and Molly have the same personality as uh, Neo and Trinity in The Matrix. So if you just think the Neo-Trinity romance is the bestest best part of The Matrix, definitely read Neuromancer. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> but if this if this is your <laughs> ship, okay, if this is your ship, I highly recommend Neuromancer because you're going to get not... something very similar in that book. I just want to make it very clear. I'm not ship shaming. It's a good ship. It's not the but best. It's not for you. It's not for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even for me. It's not the best part. There are Morpheus in general. Just the character True. Morpheus is better than all of the others. Anyway. Absolutely. No, I 100% agree. Um, this is not this is not like a shippy movie for me. But um, but if you like that part of it, the Neuromancer is excellent. Also, it's excellent in the sense that it's just like a really good cyberpunk story. Okay. Um, just like The Matrix is a really good cyberpunk story. Uh, in addition to the Neuromancer, another big influence on this movie is uh, is another movie called Dark City, which came out before The Matrix, and it has basically the same plot as The Matrix. Okay, so this guy like wakes up and he's suddenly aware of like the real world going on around him. Now in this movie, it's not like robots harvesting people. There's like these alien scientists um, where they have a bunch of people like that that are they're programming to do their bidding. They run experiments on humans, stuff like that. Um, and it came out before The Matrix, and it has a lot of the same themes. Unfortunately for Dark City, it's not very good. Sorry if you love Dark City. It's just not good. It's not a good movie. Um, it has a lot of excellent ideas in it, uh, but it's not. It's not a good movie. Just like the, And The Matrix is a much better movie because The Matrix, as we kind of talked about before, it is heavily driven by, by its plot and by its characters as opposed to by its concepts. Whereas The Dark City is like concept first, plot second, if that makes sense. Um, but if you like The Matrix, you might enjoy Dark City as like just an interesting, uh, similar cyberpunk movie. But it's, don't expect The Matrix. It's not that. Uh, but here's what the Wachowskis did that was able to take Dark City and turn it into The Matrix is they made it anime. Okay, that's the big secret sauce. I feel like that the Matrix really hit on that that makes it so excellent. So Ghost in the Shell is the other key influence here. Uh, the visuals in the Matrix pull heavily from the Ghost in the Shell, and a lot of Western directors um, will copy anime and then pretend like they're not anime fans. Uh, cough, cough, Nolan. Um, really dislike him for that. Sorry. Uh, the Wachowskis don't do this. They love anime, and they're unabashed in their love for anime. Um, you know, uh, uh, Lana Wachowski is very, very clearly a huge anime fan. And there are shots in The Matrix that are like exact shots from Ghost in the Shell. But there's other anime influence as well, but Ghost in the Shell is the big one. Uh, this is this is one where if you liked The Matrix, I highly recommend watching Ghost in the Shell. There's several different iterations of it. Uh, so you can find your favorite Ghost in the Shell flavor. Uh, you know, there's several different mangas. There's several movies. There's a couple of series. Uh, so lots, lots of different flavors of Ghost in the Shell. Uh, find your favorite. It's excellent. Just don't do the live action one with uh, what's her face. 
Yeah, it's not good with us, Scarjo. That's it. Yeah, Don't it's do. not good. It copies. Yeah. It copies like the. It copies the shell of Ghost in the also, Shell without actually getting to the heart of it. Also, we, I never saw it, but also we don't need to use technology to make actresses look more Asian. We should just hire Asian actresses. Boom. That's it. <laughs> so consume Ghost in the Shell, except for that version. Yeah, well, that version's the the least. It's the worst version anyway. Every other version is better. We gotta just we gotta ward the people. We have millions of fans who watch us weekly. We <laughs> need to ward all six of There's them. There's dozens of them. Dozens. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah the, these are the key influences so so all of this goes into the matrix and it, it just the y2k going on at the same time the fact that they really put a lot of effort into their effects and their sound editing and their visual editing and the fact that they they just took they took the right zeitgeist of influences and all baked them into the same thing oh thank you so much for the the follow um other landon account <laughs> so sorry it's okay <laughs> <laughs> um so so yeah uh, all of this goes into the matrix and it makes this just absolutely excellent movie they they put the right ingredients into their stew okay they they picked out the right meat they picked out the good potatoes okay they made their own they they made the their own stock it all went in to make this excellent movie yes it yeah. was good yeah. It, they listened to what was popular and they created something else, which is the true pinnacle of art form. They yeah. did this for the art. They didn't do this for the money. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think and that's, it's, and it's what's obvious. and it's what was popular for them. It's like the things that they truly loved. So yeah. So, all right. So now that we've had enough of history, let's talk about the philosophy okay. because this is an incredibly deep movie based off yeah. of a lot of important philosophy most of which goes over my head so <laughs> but no i think and it's and like that's kind of the point of it is it's it's dumbing down this really important concept during that time that we're going to mm -hmm. explain but yes yeah i mean i wouldn't I, I if i would have tried to pick up simulacra and simulation you know as as a child or as a teenager i would have been like what is this crap get out of my face you know but um but watching the matrix i was like I mean, my mind was blown. I was like, wow, free will is so complicated. You know, of course, I didn't think of it in those terms because I was a child, but that is what I was thinking about. Um, whereas a simulacrum simulation could not have done that for me. So, but this this movie is based on, in a lot of ways, Baudrillard's simulacrum simulation. It was required reading for the actors. And uh, funny enough, if you go look up interviews of them talking about this, like um, the only one that actually understood the book at all was Lawrence Fishburne. He was like, that was excellent, Wachowskis. Thank you for recommending this to me. I really enjoyed it. And uh, Keanu Reeves was like, I don't, I'm sorry. I'm this, I'm sure this is great, but I just. <laughs> Here's, this is the thing that I think happened. I think, I think Keanu Reeves was like, wow, I don't understand this. And then he strived for the rest of his life to try to figure it out. And now he's just the most philosophical person in Hollywood. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what he thinks now about this. Um, although I'm sure there's going to be interviews coming out whenever the movie drops, uh, yes. where we might be able to learn a little bit. But we'll see. <laughs> also, Lawrence Fishburne, amazing. Love him. He did a yeah. fantastic job. <laughs> yeah, he's so smart. He's so smart. I'm One sorry. day I want to be as smart as Lawrence Fishburne. <laughs> I will never be as smart as Lawrence Fishburne, but I will continue to strive to be at least yeah. half the amount of smart he is. Me too. Me too. So um, something to note about this is Baudrillard actually did not like The Matrix. They actually even invited him to work on the sequels, but he declined. So after the first movie was so successful, of course, they greenlit some sequels and they invited um, Baudrillard. Yeah, the Wachowskis got him his favorite thing, disappointment. Um, his issue <laughs> is that in the movie, there's a clear distinction between what is The Matrix and what is the real world, right? There's no blurring of the two. Okay, but what he's really talking about in his book is the blurring of the simulacra and simulation and the real. Okay, that's what the book is about. So, for example, when we watch most action movies, most of these, like, um, you know, Disney movies, because that's Disney makes all the movies now, in 2021, everything is touched over with computer animation. Everything. The actors' faces, the action scenes, the backgrounds. So we're not really seeing the actors, but like, we can't tell. It's so well done that we can't tell. So for Baudrillard, that's what he was talking about. And that's what he disliked. So he watched, he sees this movie that's got like 
you know, really good special effects. And he's like, y'all don't get it. Y'all don't get it. Wachowskis, whatever. I don't like this. It's too, uh, it's too like blurring. Okay. You know? So for Baudrillard, this is where he was like, very like, <laughs> in his opinion, he said, the matrix is not about my work. It's about Plato's allegory of the cave, which if you're a philosophy student, you're going to feel the insult for that. Cause that's what you learn about in one philosophy 101, right? So he's saying y'all movie, y'all's movie ain't shit as philosophy 101. That's what he's saying. So this is the direct quote. The Matrix is surely the kind of film about the Matrix that the Matrix would have been able to produce. Zing! He didn't say the zing, I added that. <laughs> In all fairness, a wide audience wouldn't have picked up that for the most part. People need, like me, need it spelled out. Exactly, Kitty. Well, we're going to get to that. Because um, I don't fully agree with Baudrillard. I think that he is being a little bit of a stick in the mud, a little bit of a, of a butt. Um, oh, Okay. No worries, Landon. Go ahead and fix that. I'll, I'll I'm going to talk for a little bit more about this. It's okay. Ignore Landon's camera for a second, guys. All right. So, um, but this did, this feedback did push the Wachowskis to take the sequels in a more philosophical direction. Um, and we'll talk about that next week when we get more into the sequels. Um, and here's what, I have a quote from Lana herself that clarified the inclusion of the book in the film. It says, but the paradigm of projecting choices is not different it's a matrix, just like Catholicism or Christianity or symbols of metaphysics or even philosophical constructs. This is why no one really mentions this, but everyone is like simulacra, as in Baudrillard. You're referencing Baudrillard. But the point of the reference is that the book is hollow. Because remember, Neo opens the book to get the disc. It's hollowed out inside on the nihilism chapter, right? It's hollowed out inside, right? Um... <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so what we're trying to do was, oh no, that's not where I stopped. Okay, it is in itself a construction, a projection, a tool for understanding the world. Having a framework of meaning, that's what these things are. They are frameworks of meaning. So what we're trying to do was, can you encourage audiences, aka regular people, okay, to interrogate their own framework of meaning, and then through that interrogation, extend it into the experience of watching a piece of art, and then try to find meaning in that piece of art in the same way that Neo has to go through that journey, okay? So, Baudrillard, you're just kind of, you're just kind of like being a little bit of a stick in the mud. You're being kind of a nihilist. Here is what it reminds me of. Mm -hmm. It is that college professor who is a doc? Who is a doctorate in a specific thing? We're not going to pull from personal experience. Oh yeah, I'm Dr. Say, Terry. Here. Call me Dr. Terry. Doctor, 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 doctor. doctor. We've all had Terry, that professor. Written, <laughs> Dr. Terry, who's written three books on Shakespeare and his plays, and is an expert in Shakespearean literature. I'm mm -hmm. not pulling from actual events or anything like that. And they're teaching a Shakespeare 101 class in a small ass school in Maine. Uh, it, it, you, like you can't expect freshmen to get that level and be that passionate about Shakespeare. So Bouldriard's like expecting this Matrix movie that is supposed to be for a wide audience, that is supposed to be consumable for the average person, for people to like consume and, and understand his works or even be able to produce a movie that has the full lesson of his works is a little ridiculous a stick in the mud <laughs> and is like a doctor who who doesn't understand that people aren't as passionate or as enlightened as he is yeah no it's very <laughs> true it's very true and, and I mean it really does like I think you hit the nail on the head he absolutely does remind me of college professors that were like I'm a doctor you must call me doctor I'm Dr. Terry doctor 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 I'm so much smarter than you doctor doctor you know that is it's definitely what he reminds me of here um but let's talk about that okay so um neo excuse me sorry i didn't want to didn't want my nose dripping on camera um How so neo you. opens the book <laughs> so neo opens the book to the the chapter on nihilism it's hollowed out right so obviously this is deliberate uh, nihilism isn't the chapter is not in the middle of the book, but it looks like it on screen. So they obviously chose this chapter on purpose. So what's that chapter about? So what Baudrillard's talking about in this chapter is what we would call um, nihilism, right? But he talks about contemporary nihilism, which he considers neutral. Okay, so I'm gonna explain what I what I mean by that. 
Um, and he encourages us to, um, through examination, but instead in difference, okay? So what he means is that nihilism in the past would have had an active destruction of something. So nihilism in the past would have been like, you know, trying to, to destroy something that's in your way from just living or something like that. But now it instead refers to a simulated life. And this is a little bit revealing about Baudrillard himself because he basically is saying in this chapter, Baudrillard is saying he cannot find meaning in the world. He's like, so I, so Baudrillard is saying like, I can't find meaning. Um, because he's been subject personally to an overdose of images, and thus he considers himself this type of nihilist. He can't find God or purpose. And in his view, he wonders if the divine even does exist. Or if it does exist, then he concludes that it's rendered inaccessible behind a labyrinth of images. So basically what he's saying is that the simulations and the simulacra created by capitalism make life meaningless and he feels his life is meaningless. So, I, yeah. I can't help but wonder if he's ever considered that he was just depressed. I mean, he probably was. I mean, no, I don't I think he's wrong. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I need to throw that out there because I'm just like, wow, this philosophy is great, but also have you considered <laughs> medication? I mean, you can't, you obviously can't diagnose someone from a book that they oh wrote. God. No, but, and, I, and I'm not like, yeah, and I'm also not that. a doctor, so I would never diagnose it anyway. Um, but it, has, it has that, it has that like aura around it, doesn't it? It's like, Baudrillard, maybe you just didn't like this movie because you don't like anything. Like it kind of feels like that a little bit. <laughs> or maybe, maybe this was too accurate and now you don't like what you've written. <laughs> <laughs> also like you can't control how people can like how people interpret the work that you've done uh that's that is philosophy 101 yeah, and yeah. maybe you should refer you maybe you should go back to the cave metaphor um <laughs> well to be no. fair it wasn't like it wasn't like Baudrillard has a twitter account and he just tweeted this shit out like randomly he was asked in an interview okay Absolutely. so full context it wasn't like he just randomly called up the wachowskis and was like fuck you guys you didn't write my stuff you wrote P Plato's you know allegory of the cave boom click like that is not like that he was asked he answered the question no, <laughs> but then, still his que his answer is just his answer is very like it's just lacking heart like where's the soul like it's okay to like things Baudrillard like it's okay life isn't that his, horrible according to his book they're, it's not okay <laughs> um it also just what this really does and, and like talking about this and what it really like opens up as far as someone who's watched Matrix for the first time 20 years after it was produced um someone who is like new to this philosophy uh and this all of these comments and books and things were like produced prior to the technology explosion in the early 2000s and uh, up until now um I, it makes me very curious what even Baudrillard's as far as his perspective on his philosophy now that we have even more of a melding of uh a social online presence and an online life versus a, a like a matrix life versus an real life sort of thing mm -hmm. um and and how his philosophies might have grown since then and what the matrix also has to say which is why i'm a little bit looking forward to the fourth one because i wonder if they'll bring some of that in We'll see. We'll see. We'll I mean, see. I definitely think that overall social media does not have the best um, effects on most people's mental health. And it seems oh, like Baudrillard not. was very sensitive to that because um, he was having those same effects just from, you know, watching blockbuster movies, <laughs> you know. But it, it certainly, but it also, like, not only does it have not the best, like, skew view on self, but it's also completely redefined how we view ourselves and yeah. how the different generations view ourselves. And that's what a lot of, like, philosophy modern day philosophy has been talking about too is that combination so it's just it's one of those things where it's like philosophy has to be constantly updated like yeah. like even Plato and his al oligarchies and everything like that has to be taken into a modern context in some ways mm -hmm. um and, and updated so it's just fascinating to see I'm yeah, curious super fascinating me too but I actually think I think the reality is that the Wachowskis and Baudrillard really do agree and understand each other the difference is that the Wachowskis are simply more hopeful 
Like, I think they're more hopeful about these these ideas. Like, I think they agree with Baudrillard, and I think Baudrillard actually agrees with them, too. It's just that the Wachowskis have a hopeful outlook, whereas Baudrillard has a uh, more dismal outlook. Like, they're he doesn't know what to do. He sees these problems. He doesn't know what to do about them. He doesn't know how to exist with them. He doesn't know how to fix them. He doesn't, he doesn't know what to do um, and, and, uh, and feels very, like, um, you know, trapped in his matrix, right? Whereas the Wachowskis feel like, no, there is still power in action. We can still try to fix this. Oh, we can try. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, no, I think that that is two very different looks. And obviously I think that theme plays more into the matrix. Like as yes. far as that hope, that is the hope that, that Morpheus carries. That is the faith that he carries in his character. Yeah. That is that's, the- That's real faith. That is the representation and th theme of Neo himself. Mm -hmm. Like that is that is the lesson that is being taught in this in this movie, of of that there is still hope. Um, and so yeah, maybe he doesn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, we only have that one interview that I really was able to pull from to get. We're allowed it, but, to but, yeah. speculate. This is yeah, pure but speculation. I love. But I love. I, I but I, I I have to agree with the Wachowskis. I do think there is value in still um pursuing what in the movie i guess we would call true love and pursuing faith and pursuing the power of um of humanity i do oh, think yeah. there is there is a a lot of value in that although i do agree with baudrillard and and sometimes i do feel despair and like i don't know how to fix this and i and all of these things where i think like you know our, our current uh landscape of the web 2.0 is like destroying us mentally like i do think that um, and I do think that it's because we can't tell the difference between real and simulation anymore. I do think that, but I still think there's power in, in human connection and there are certain things about the internet that have given me greater human connection that I could have had in the real world, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and also like humans adapt to our situation. So you're right, we might not be able to tell the difference between reality and simulation in certain aspects, but maybe that then means that our definition of real has to change and it has it has changed like the definition of like friendships online has changed like our society continues to change and i think that that's something that his nihilism and his look on that doesn't take into consideration is it is that it is that adaptation that humans have and the resilience we have and have had um that makes us uniquely human yeah i would agree so yeah, um, this movie was quite different than other action movies, wouldn't you say? <laughs> I would! <laughs> uh, and I don't think it's just because it is based off of a philosophy. Uh, yeah. I think there are lots of things that make it different. But obviously, uh, one of the biggest ones being the, the meaning and the theme behind it. Obviously, everything in media has a theme of some sort, whether it's intentional or not. Uh, but I think that this one has purposeful and every single scene is is built towards it. Whereas action movies, typically, if we think about especially modern day action movies, don't have as complicated relationships to their theme. True. Tends to be very simple. Simplified. Yes. Like, you know, teamwork is good for the Avengers and, yeah. <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So... <laughs> So yeah, uh, um, we pulled out several different things that that we that we thought was very different about the Matrix. The first one being the male gaze. Um, this movie is really feminine for an action movie, don't you think? It's probably the most feminine action movie I can think of outside of like literal female action hero yes. movies. This is the most feminine one that has a male protagonist. I should say. I guess, and I definitely think that there is still hints of the male gaze in there mm -hmm. um that there are still things that that hint towards it however I would agree with you as far as this is not a movie that has the female gaze but this is a very low level male gaze movie uh which made it very nice to watch because <laughs> I was not like <laughs> being like oh my god she's not being sexualized because of her boobs and ass I don't just have boobs and ass in my face every second that Trinity is on screen she's a fully developed character what is this it was probably refreshing for you because you could see her a lot easier and it was because I know you struggled seeing the complexity in Faye's character because so much of her uh, portrayal on screen was like uh, boobs and ass, right? Like, as you said, for Cowboy yeah. Bebop, this was probably a breath of fresh air. Like, oh, it I was, can see her. <laughs> it was, and it's not even a, a um, 
breath of fresh air, like just coming off of Cowboy Bebop, but just in general, Mm -hmm. like even looking at action movies that I can relate it to, I know that they're not the same, but because superhero and Marvel movies are just what action movies are, are right now, like trying to relate it and being like, wow, this is a fully blown developed character, unlike Black Widow like that was constantly which is in the supposed to be in the same like she's a badass character uh the fighter the powerful yeah. one but even she was more sexualized within her yeah. role yeah. than trinity was yeah i feel like we can't get a single a, a single writer that's tried to tackle black widow in the movie the mcu I'm not talking about the comics but in the mcu we can't get a single one to take her seriously like i've said <laughs> <laughs> we can't but um but trinity is taken very seriously in this movie she is on par with neo and morpheus like they are those three are clearly the main characters they're incredibly well developed um and uh and, and you get to know how they think and, and feel uh, about themselves their inner world not just how neo relates to them of course neo is the pov character so you get that but you also get lots of glimpses into how trinity thinks and feels of herself yeah. and the way that she's thought that she's um the way that she's shot by the camera like the camera doesn't leer on her either she's seen as a full character in her own right by the camera which is just it's just beautiful and i and i have to think that this point of view has to be heavily influenced on the Wachowskis like own relationship with gender yeah Um, because they're both they're both trans they're both trans uh women and so uh the idea of when this was first produced they were not out um they were still presenting as as male and so their terms and idea of the male gaze obviously had a very different point of view than a cis straight white man which is what a lot of our action movies nowadays and even back then were being produced and written by Mm -hmm. um so that definitely does have an impact and i think that that's why it also feels safer and then obviously like the matrix itself being a trans allegory and then continues to and continues to uh interact with those themes in the sequels to the extent i obviously don't know yet but i've heard that you're gonna find out (laughs) i'm about to find out um but that definitely i think helps us have a fully developed female protagonist um like who's not the who's not the main character point of view but who is a is obviously a very important role in it and then also have well-rounded men and male characters that are deeper than their need to be the hero Mm -hmm. uh, which is also a very male gaze sort of take on men's characters yeah. I mean, even though this movie does have a little bit of that, like at the end, Neo's the one that has to come save the day because he's the one, he's the chosen one. So it still does that. But I feel like when this movie does it, it's more about because narrative demands that that a story be paced that way. That's just how Western narratives work. It doesn't feel like to me it's at the detriment of the other characters. I do wish, of course, that Trinity could have been a little more helpful in the very end um, beyond a kiss. But um, she She's helpful all the way up until the final point. Like she is the badass bruiser, kick ass, you know, enforcer all the way up until till the very end where Neo has to do the final fight himself. She resurrected Jesus. What are you talking about? I she mean... is... <laughs> We'll talk about her in a second. We can't get that. We can't go on this Trinity Trinity things. We have we have a slide dedicated to her. We do. <laughs> but yeah, the, there is the male gaze in this movie. The, I mean, this is a true four quadrant movie. So if you're in the movie business, like you, the four quadrant means that you're appealing to everybody. So you're appealing to kids, you're appealing to adults, you're appearing, appealing to men, you're appealing to women. So you're trying to appeal to everyone, right? So everyone and this movie does it this movie does it in space it has stuff for you if you're an adult it has stuff for you if you're a kid it has stuff for you if you're if you're more masculine it has stuff for you if you're more feminine it, it has something for everybody and it is because they do not spend a lot of time um focused on that male gaze that action movies typically do absolutely yeah all right to the next one the diverse and unique characters. Uh, considering that this is 2000 live action United States made movie, uh, the cast of characters is incredibly diverse. Um, as far as race goes, we we have obviously a black man and a black woman or a black man as part of the uh, main cast and a black woman with that's playing an integral part. Uh, the diversity in background characters is accurate to what I would picture New York City to be like. Their crowds look like crowds of real people. Yes. 
instead of just crowds of white people. Uh, and considering <laughs> once again, highlighting that this is 2000, this is year 2000, 1999. Um, it, it, it doesn't live up to the standards and expectations that we would have today in today's movies, but taking into the context of where Hollywood was back then, this is a diverse movie. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then all of the characters being the uniquity, like the unique that they are, as far as per, as far as like driven personalities, uh, different fightings or like different like ways of of fighting for what they want, mm -hmm. um, is is very vast and extreme, and it's really easy in action movies, especially blockbuster action movies, to pigeonhole your heroes into a certain category, and yeah, yeah. Uh, the Matrix really avoids this, which is makes it different. <laughs> it's refreshing, and you'll see when you watch the sequels, Landon, that this diversity continues. Um, the sequels are incredibly diverse as well, and even more diverse, I would say, than the original movie, because by then the Wachowskis were popular and they got a little bit more leeway with being able to do what they wanted. Now, they still weren't able to, in um, in this original movie or in the sequels, have an actual trans character. They're, apparently, Lana asked for several different characters to be trans. We're going to talk about one in a little bit. Um, never stuck. The producers always said no. Lana, no, <laughs> you know, um, but uh, but the where they could get diversity, they did. They made every effort to have diversity in all of the places that the um, that Warner Brothers would let them. Yeah, and and again for two thousand, it was amazing that we had directors and advocates and producers who were incredibly uh, vocal with what they wanted and pushed for that mm -hmm. uh, because that was not happening yeah. back then um yeah so it, it for the time period it was very diverse which i am very grateful for because when you watch it you're like oh man that's great <laughs> i'm so yeah, glad that just, i'm not just watching a bunch of white people <laughs> it looks real you know it looks real and i always yeah. appreciate that when i'm when i look at a scene when i look at a crowd when i look at a cast and it looks like a, a group of people that i would see you know somewhere where i live as if you all know i live in the southeast right obviously we have a very diverse population there are a lot of black people here there are a lot of um latino people here uh in particular so whenever i see something that looks all white i'm like where is this maine sorry landon <laughs> it's true, it's true, the whitest the whitest <laughs> state uh we are in fact just made of snow here uh which is why i think that i look for that in my movies to sit there and be mm -hmm. like i hope that this doesn't take place in maine if it's going to be new york city then there ought to be a wide variety of different characters yeah, uh, sure. and and it's something i do notice actively because i don't have it around me uh yeah. as much as i wish i did yeah one day so yes uh diverse and unique characters um the other thing too is that the development of those characters are put above the idea and call for action. Mm -hmm. So this is the traditional style of an action movie of a hero's journey. It really does fall in line with that genre. However, a lot of the time special effects, um, action like dumps, being able to have large fights, being able to have impressive the set moves, pieces. The, yeah, exactly. Those are the the bread and butter of action movies. In this particular action movie, the character development and the storytelling plot is, excuse me, plot and character development, both are king in, in terms of this goes. Um, and because of that, it also breaks the, like the uh, three acts rule a little bit. It still falls in line with it. You can have that argument, um, but the this timing and the spacing of those three act rules really uh are kind of broken because they want to focus on development rather than the comfortability of action mm -hmm. like there are there are lots of goals that the matrix has they want to have cool action scenes obviously they put a lot of work into that they um they think the philosophy that they're trying to uh, to advocate for is very important they put a lot of work into that part but what is clearly where the love really is is in the characters and and asking what would this character do in this situation right it's not about the philosophy it's not about the action it's about the story again the wachowskis are writers and they spent a lot of time on the writing for the matrix and i just wish that modern movies you know, put more resources into their writers because I know there are good writers out there and they're not given the time, space, or pay to do their thing. 
And that's how we end up with action movies where the only thing good about the movie is the big action set piece fight. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's two thirds of the way through the movie and it's like the big blowout scene and it's awesome. And, you know, you had to watch an hour of boringness to get to it. Right. It is of my belief that that will change now that how we are consuming media and movies will change because of COVID. I hope. Um, Prior to COVID, I don't think we would ever return to this type of movie or have a, or have a society where making this type of movie for the big screen would have been possible. It would have been continued to separate between popular genre of, of movie watching and what Oscar is now bait. award and now Oscar <laughs> bait. Um, and those, those Both of which are badly movies. written, by the way. I don't think Oscar bait is well written. <laughs> I think that there are really there are some well written Oscar Oscar bait movies. For but sure, now but that, there's some now- well written blockbuster movies too. You know, absolutely. But now that we no longer have the need, it seems that this is the way society is changing. Uh, if it continues that like HBO Max is able to produce movies streaming from home, now that we no longer, movies no longer have to pay the expensive fees of being shown all across the United States and the world in movie theaters and have that be a large part of its budget and just be able to be released on Netflix or HBO and those just be as considered as like worthy and popular and money makers, we Mm -hmm. are going to start seeing more of of well-written things. Gosh, I hope. I hope. I hope. I I would love it. I would love it. I mean, there are still like well, well well-written movies. Um, one that springs to mind that I saw recently in the pandemic was Free Guy. Excellent movie. Ryan Reynolds movie. Very well written. Very charming. Very good. Um, but they're few and far between nowadays. You know what I mean? Where I watch a movie and the thing I like about it is the writing. I'm really excited for Spencer. I want to see that one. Oh yeah, hopefully that'll be good. It looks like it could be good. So, but yeah. Also, we talked about this very briefly, but this is a four quadrant movie. This is the intended audience is for everybody. And they don't just say, hey, this is a movie to bring your family. Everyone will enjoy it. It's that they marketed it for everybody. And there is something for everyone in this movie that makes anyone who watches it walk away and be like, hey, that was a good movie. (laughs) Like I mentioned my friend earlier that was like, Karen, I just don't get it. You know, but she did think... Neo was real good looking and he kicked butt real nicely. Okay, she did think that. <laughs> so she still enjoyed the movie even though she was didn't get it. Um, there's something for everybody, literally. And uh, and I, I know we don't we're not gonna talk about this. We don't want to spend like a lot of time on this, but I will say that it's very obvious that this is a movie for everybody based on the red pill meme that everyone misinterprets what the red pill and the blue pill is about. And so there's now these like dude bros that talk about getting red pilled. The red pill, guys, like don't, I don't know. I guess nobody's told them, but like, um, guys, the red pill is estrogen. It's estrogen, okay? It's estrogen. <laughs> it's estrogen. I guess they want to be women. I understand. I, I I understand I am one and I <laughs> so I get it. <laughs> but um but yeah, I mean it's it's for everybody. So and because it's for everybody, there's a lot of wild misinterpretations, but it also means that it is incredibly accessible. Incredibly accessible. Like anybody can sit and watch this movie and have a good damn time. Which is awesome. And yeah. honestly, how I want movies to be written. Yeah, That's like what? I want more of this. I want a movie that's Everyone can watch it. Everyone can enjoy it. And it's well-written, good, tight story. Like, I, I want more of this. Me too. Yeah. All right. And the final thing is the unexpected protagonist. Yeah. Uh, you meet Neo, who is a dorky, lanky computer programmer. And you do not think protagonist in an action movie. Mm-hmm. Keanu Reeves is hot. I understand that people find him attractive. He is not what you first think of, especially when we're looking looking at something that was produced early that year that is an action movie. He is not Brad Pitt. He's not like any of the guys in Fight Club. <laughs> like he is a he is Keanu Reeves. Um, and so like that, the the way that he looks, first of all, but also the way that he acts, um, mm-hmm. which is gonna kind of drag us into our topic on Neo. Yeah, so so Landon Landon has this um has this theory 
in regards to Neo of how like she interpreted him that I hadn't really heard before, but I think it's really interesting. And I'm kind of like on board now, the more that I think about it. So yeah, Landon, um, as our first thing with, with Neo, could you um, tell us like how you read him? Like, what did you think when you saw him? I met Neo and I thought it was very obvious uh, right off the bat that he was coded for autism, that he was autistic coded. Um, just the way that he acted and interacted with other people, the uh, certain sort of habits that he had, the way that he analyzed the world. Um, it was it was very interesting to me to sit there and be like, oh, this, this is an autistic character who uh, is viewing the world differently. And that is in the end, what makes him special about like why like, it doesn't it doesn't exactly lead into him being the one but it was an interesting take to have this idea because for me it was so obvious that I just assumed everyone had this theory <laughs> when watching it and I was just like okay what are they trying to what are they trying to say as far as this autistic person who views the world differently is given the choice of free will continues to move through the world autistically and is then expected to be the one because of how he views the world and his ability to interact with the things around him the ability to break things down the higher ability of thinking things of being able to literally stop bullets where they are mm -hmm. um and obviously there's a lot of programming that goes into that later but it was just an interesting thing where it was like oh we have a character that is coded autistic and he is considered the one um and this can be really like saying a lot or it could also be saying nothing <laughs> um but for me, it was just very interesting to interact with that. And then when I told Karen that, she's like, I've never thought of that or never heard that. And I'm like, oh, it's just me then. <laughs> well, back in the early 2000s, like we didn't, like yeah. we didn't really, the, the word autism wasn't in the popular lexicon. Like everybody that had trouble in school was ADD or ADHD, right? Like autistic, I'm not saying there weren't autistic people, obviously there were autistic people, but like you, you didn't necessarily talk about it. It wasn't a big deal. You maybe knew one autistic kid, right? Like it wasn't, it wasn't like a big thing at that time. One so I just hadn't heard that, but he does, yeah. but he has, he has the hyperfixation, right? On the matrix and solving this puzzle. He is a programmer, which a lot, for a lot of autistic people, that is a career they can thrive in because they are very, very good at plugging into systems and breaking them down. Oh, what's Neo tasked with doing? Plugging into a system and breaking it down. Yeah. So I just was like, um, I thought this was amazing. Yeah. And then also like his interactions, uh, as far as being able to pick up certain social cues and, um, stuck on certain ideas and everything like that it was just, for me, it was very much like, oh, this is, this is coded autism. Uh, and we can't use that word because A, it was the 90s, so that wasn't a word. Also, autism looked very different. It didn't look the level of Neo is. Um, I do believe like if autism is a spectrum, he's a, a higher end of the spectrum. He is oh, not- Oh he'd be super probably, high functioning, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's very high functioning. He is not what, if people were using the word autism, not what people were thinking of with that. Not at that time, not at that um, time. But coming at it from the 2021 perspective where there is a whole spectrum of autism and different levels of functioning and, and understanding and even having a background information, like obviously not a doctor, can't, just, can't um, diagnose anybody, but I work with kids. So I have to be aware of, at least somewhat aware of the psychology of autism um, because I work with kids with autism. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, I have to at least know that much. And this is familiar patterns that I've seen in my work and I've seen in kids and I've seen in adults with autism. Um, so it's just, it's very interesting that this might've been, whether it was purposeful or not. Um, I think that now looking back on it with this perspective and this knowledge, it for me was very obvious. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're cracking me up with your with your comments about um, Lana's little diss on Keanu Reeves. It's not really it's not really a diss, but it's true. Like at that Did time, <laughs> at, but at that time, Keanu Reeves was he was a comedian, right? Like he was in yeah. Bill and Ted and stuff like that at that time. So he's not That's who you would have thought of. Like they kept trying to make him put him in heartthrob movies. Like he was in Sweet November. It's awful movie. Sorry if you like that movie. Um, but uh, so you didn't really think of him in as, as an action star, but uh, but now we do because of John Wick, which are excellent movies. But um, but he wouldn't have been in, he'd chosen for John Wick if he hadn't had the role of Neo, of course, because before that he was like he was like a comedian. He was like a dopey, funny guy, you know. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's that's kind of that. That was true. That was true at that time for for what Keanu Reeves was doing before The Matrix. 
Also, like, so let's talk about Neo. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I want to defend my, I want to defend my opinion. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, no. no. I know I was just gonna say and also like look at the other people who had action movies during that time he is mm-hmm. not Brad Pitt he is not built the stocky muscled person he obviously was very cut in this movie he was very in shape but like you look at Keanu Reeves with clothes on and you're just like man you probably play video games forever <laughs> yeah well and you know um Neo does well when he's in plugged into the matrix yes. that's what he that's what he does he he browses the internet all day you know <laughs> my parents and think it was I'm, very I'm on... Oh. It was very realistic, but it was also like, this is not what you would picture as a, as a superhero, which is literally yeah. what he becomes. He becomes the Matrix form of a superhero. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is not what you would picture. Even now, like you can compare it to movies now. He is not what, you know, Chris Hemsworth or any of the Chris's. Like he's not mm-hmm. built that way. No, he's not. He's not. Um, yeah, for sure. But we love Neo. So let's talk about him. Um, so one of the things that the Wachowskis do in the Matrix is they employ the, uh, the JK Rowling method of naming their characters. Uh, Most of their characters have this crazy awesome meaning behind their name, except the Wachowskis do it right. They do it better. Okay. They don't have an example where it's just like, this person is Moon Moon because they're a werewolf. Okay. I, All of the names are really cool is what I'm trying to also, say. Every single time you say that, like, it's like the JK Rowling method. I'm, I like, part of me is like, she didn't invent it. And then I'm like, actually the first Harry Potter came out before this. So she might have. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I don't think she did. I'm sure there were other she, authors that did this before, but... but she's she's the pop. She popularized it, right? Oh, and when you, no, and, and when you say when you say the J.K. Rowling method, everyone knows what you're talking about. So, but yeah, they do this. So they do this, except they do it well. So they Neo, do. of course, means new. It is also an anagram for one, uh, which he mm-hmm. is. He is the one. He is the one, but he's also the new version of the one, which is an incredibly smart, like, if, if they meant to do that, incredibly smart thing there, because obviously there's a whole idea of reincarnation that's underlined in this as far as like the oracle saying that you probably have to die one more time and he does get reincarnated yeah. in the yeah end. she goes she's like maybe your next life who knows um, and then guess what he dies and comes back trinity brings him back and oh now he's the one <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly so it is like this idea of the new version of the one uh and so like having that in there is really cool the anagram i didn't even pick up on uh karen said that to me and i was like holy shit <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing yeah um and then he's also like has this weird balance of being the chosen one but he's also the chooser he is the one who is consistently and constantly within the realm of this movie given a choice between two things yeah uh red pill versus blue pill to jump off the roof to not jump off the roof to yep. dodge the bullet to not dodge the bullet uh and he he is constantly in the position of choosing while also everyone is choosing him, uh, which is a very interesting sort of take on a protagonist. Mm -hmm. Um, And he has to warm up to it. Like when it comes to his choices, he has to warm up to them. Like the first choice that he's faced with, which you mentioned, like, does he, um, well, no, I think you're, that's a different one. The first choice that he's given is whenever um, Morpheus calls him and he said, basically says, hey, a- the agents are after you. That's basically what he's trying to communicate to yes. him. And um, and he has to choose. Neo has to choose. Do you climb down this building, which is very, very dangerous? Do you trust this man to, to know that actually it's going to be fine? You're going to be okay to climb up on the roof um, and we'll come get you? Or, you know, do you go back inside and be taken by the agents? And of course, it's his first choice and he's scared. So he chooses the familiar. He chooses to go into the agent's custody. And then, yeah, and then like every choice that he makes like progressively gets more and more and more risky until his choice of going to save Morpheus results in his death. And then it's like, oh, you have now taken all the risks. You can be the one. You have exercised your free will to its max. You can be the one, you get it. You get the system. It's interesting because, like, also there was a choice before that as far as following the woman with the rat, following the white rabbit into Wonderland. Mm, that's um, true. Yeah, he does have to choose that, that choice. But it's very interesting that he makes all of these choices, all of these choices of, you know, climb down the building and run or get turned in. He makes wrong choices. He might makes right choices, and in the end, his final choice that he has, he knows the results. It is the first mm-hmm. time that he knows the results of his choices. 
And that is like an also an interesting thing to sit there and be like, he's been making all these choices off of faith. And now in the moment of che- of saving the faithful, he gets to know what the answer is and what the choice is fully. Yeah. No, he, he doesn't know he's going to become the one. He knows he's going to die. He's going to die. Which is <laughs> yeah. like, is, I mean, obviously he doesn't have the full thing, the full scope. Although hinted at, he does know that because he also knows the Oracle says that his, possibly his next life, he'll be ready. Yeah. But and he also he knows that the person know. that, yeah. And then he also knows the person Trinity falls in love with is going to become the one. Yeah. And so like he has, he has all the tools to figure that out, but he doesn't really know it. All he knows is that Morpheus has done so much for him. And he cares about Morpheus and he's not going to let this movement die. He's not going to let Morpheus die. Um, And his life is worth that. He's going to put his life before, um, before uh, any, before the, the movement. Right. And it's because, and it's not because of the movement. It's because he cares about Morpheus. It's because he wants to save his new friend who has opened his eyes to all of these things and shown him so much, right? That's what he cares about. Um, and I and I just love that because I think it really speaks to like the crux of the matrix and what they're what the Wachowskis are really trying to say is that if we just care about those around us, if we just think about those around us and trying to protect those in our lives and in our neighborhoods and in our cities, then we can make better choices instead of trying to think about class interests right or trying to think about um you know identity interests specifically instead let's think about our friends and our families and our neighbors exactly yeah very powerful very and then again he is the unconventional hero he he is the whether it be the autism uh, the autism look on it uh whether it be the trans allegory that it happens with him uh i know that there's a lot of queer uh hinting i don't even want to call it coding um but there's a lot of queer hinting as there's well some queer vibes there's some queer, queer vibes, vibes going on <laughs> uh queer vibes especially in the sequels from what i've heard uh <laughs> there there are uh, a lot of things that make him unique as a protagonist especially a big money maker blockbuster protagonist mm-hmm. um so i love that i think that's great yeah love neo he's wonderful yeah okay um, you got it <laughs> But I think that that leads us into uh, the person who sends him on his mission. Yeah. Uh, Dream daddy. (laughs) Also Morpheus. I love Morpheus. Like, don't get me wrong. Oracle is my favorite part of this. But Morpheus and what he represents within this movie, both thematically and like the, the role he plays is beautiful it's it's mm-hmm. an amazing it's like the kingmaker but not self not self like selfish it's the selfless kingmaker and it's a beautiful trope that i love and i want to see more of um but this is morpheus and morpheus is named is the god of dreams in greek mythology um and he is the role that he plays trope wise and thematically is the believer of the pri- priest um he is the man with the higher power the faithful who is who is there to take his herd and shepherd his herd to the idea of of belief in this higher power that he represents um except they don't do it they have the religious undertone but it's not based on religion it's not an allegory or a belief system for religion which is what makes this character so cool (laughs) Yeah, he's kind of like all of the best apostles rolled into one character. And the thing that I love about Morpheus is all of his faith is based on personal experience. Like he tells you that he didn't used to have this strong of faith, but everything that keeps happening to him, every instance that he has where he learns more about the Matrix, where he learns more about the One, where he learns more about what's going on in Zion, everything he learns, he becomes more faithful. Like it's faith through like personal and material experiences that he has had and like that's I love that because that's how my faith works too like you know that's and that's how faith really works like people talk about people that are like really Christian for example like talk about their faith and it's not because this is what I think some people that don't understand religious people sometimes miss it's not because some priest told them this that and the other it's because they had a personal experience where they felt they needed to follow a church and so they did, you know, and that's really what Morpheus is going through. 
And I think like, I think that as Americans, especially those of us who, who don't believe in the Christian faith, uh, get that priest, get that higher power shoved down our throat so much that this kind of character can be seen as very off-putting and yeah. not legitimate. Like it, it can feel as very fake. It um, can. <laughs> it, it can feel as very pushy, especially when taken into context of the idea that this character is like in most movies is a Christian character who believes the higher power of God and the Christian faith of God. Um, and, and it's so rarely do you see a believable character that's, that's faith is not in the, not in a translatable way of God. Like, obviously there is, there are Jesus undertones as far as the the one and the risen and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, like, I mean, but, Neo is obviously a Jesus allegory. Yeah. Like if you didn't, if you didn't get it, so like, duh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like there, the something that he believes in is humankind and the human ability to continue on. Mm -hmm. um, and it has nothing to do with, like there's an idea of faith especially when it's in terms of, of religion and I'm not trying to offend anyone. So if I am saying something, I'm so sorry, but there's an idea of like, oh, I'm going to be faithful because this is out of my control. Uh, and he is faithful to the point of, he still thinks that he has control of certain situations, even if there is free will that is out of his control or mm -hmm. like he doesn't have free will that there are certain things that are out of his control. Yeah. Um, like whether Neo is the one or not, he can't control that. However, he is going to believe it because that belief is powerful enough to get him through to do the right thing. Yeah. Um, and that's a really cool interpretation of this kind of character that mm -hmm. feels both genuine and real and made me see this type of character for how cool it can be. Yeah. Um, which is awesome. Like I, I am in love with Morpheus. <laughs> He's the best. And I mean, Lawrence Fishburne yeah. is one of the standout performances in, in this, um, in this movie, in addition to the Oracle. And I think, um, Cypher is also a standout performance, the guy that plays him. Um, but yeah, Lawrence Fishburne just, I, I've seen this movie now probably like a dozen times. Lawrence Fishburne blows me away every time. He's just, yeah. he's so cool and he's so charismatic and he's so like, he's so honest. Like when I watch Morpheus, I really feel like Lawrence Fishburne like is Morpheus. Like he believes everything that he's saying, and um, and like if if Lawrence Fishburne were in this world, like he would act just how Morpheus acts. Like that's how that's how raw and real the performance feels to me. And I don't know if that's true. Obviously, maybe he's just a very very good actor, but that's how it feels. He's just he's character. excellent, so good. Yeah, I love this character in there, and then I just I think also like. I love that. I love that. Yeah. His honesty, but also he's like the perfect hype man. Like I want him to be my best friend. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> There's like this line that he says to Neo, especially about like Neo has come from hearing from the Oracle that he is not the one. And he is like determined to tell Morpheus because Morpheus is risking his life for Neo because Morpheus believes that he is the one. And Morpheus just continuously, continuously is just like, I don't need to know what the Oracle to told you is for you. I don't care. I don't need to know. I believe you are the one. You are amazing. You are all this. And I'm just like, wow, I need, I need that sort of like hype man in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's to true. just believe in me, even if I don't believe in me. Yeah, uh, he does. He does. He represents. believes, he believes completely, completely in Neo. Like yeah. completely. He is the faithful and it's just, it's amazing. So good. So good. I can That's talk part about of the movie. I can talk about Morpheus forever, but shall we move to Trinity? Yes. So Trinity. Mm -hmm. So Trinity's great. I mean, obviously, like, she's called Trinity. Like, there's religious undertones here. She She's called the Trinity, right? And in, in, in Christianity, of course, we have the Trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I feel like, and she plays three roles, too. Um, and the roles that, that we think of when we think of Trinity um is the role of the Holy Ghost, right? Like she's she's the one kind of, um, you know, going out, uh, you know, to people and that sort of thing. She also plays um, a Mary Magdalene sort of role where she is, you know, Neo's partner, romantic partner. But she also plays like a John the Father kind of role where she is the one that's the protector, you know, and, and John the Father's story, of course, is that um, God gets his wife pregnant 
and John now has to be the father to this supernatural child that is not his, that he did not ask for, right? But he steps up and he does it, and he protects baby Jesus from the world until Jesus is old enough to protect himself. Um, and that is what Trinity does. She's the protector. She's, you know, she's she's the bouncer at the door. She's the the punchy, you know, gonna gonna you know uh, do all of the action scenes. She's great. So I mean, she's everything. She's everything all rolled up into one character. Awesome. Love her. Yeah, she has that um, idea of the acolyte. Like she is, mm -hmm. she's obviously a follow a follower of Morpheus. She is. If Morpheus is the priest, then she is the person in the church singing the loudest. Like she, she is a believer of what he believes, but doesn't have the faith that she doesn't have the like faith as deep as him. Uh, it shakes a little bit. There is a little bit of, of wariness, especially like when faced with Neo telling him, telling her that she's, he's not the one. Yeah. She like, believes him. Whereas Morpheus is like, no. <laughs> and, and Morpheus is just like, I don't even need to hear it. <laughs> um and uh so yeah it is it is this whole like so she is a faithful follower but she is not representation of faith in general but she is the person who reaches out to neo she is the person who like at first to follow the white rabbit she is the person who is doing the work uh for morpheus so that kind of takes that holy spirit again that protector and the father mm -hmm. uh she, and then she resurrects that, him she's the one yeah. that resurrects him so she i mean she, she is like the holy ghost him. Yeah. um very similar as as mary did as far as like because i believe it's been a very long time since i read the bible but <laughs> i believe that mary had a lot to do with like waiting outside for a resurrection of jesus yeah yeah and, she's a big she's a she's um, part of the resurrection story she, well the mary the mother is part of resurrection story yeah yes yeah. Uh, but she plays all of these these different uh, these different parts that are vital to the allegory of Neo rising and becoming the chosen one. Yeah, um, which and is that's a great part of the Matrix. So this is this is another this is something that really goes back to um, how it's all about the plotting characters. Like none of the characters are one to one allegories of anything. Like there there's all kinds of themes in here of um, of the Jesus story, obviously, but there's no one character that's like a one-to-one, -one, right? Except for Neo being Jesus. But every other character is kind of this amalgamation that is really unique to this specific Jesus allegory. Um, something that makes the Matrix excellent. Yeah, no, and it's, it's like the allegory of the religious undertext of the allegory is is a lot like like now that we're talking about it however it's not in your face about it and also it's not the point of it yeah it's <laughs> not that makes sense. So like that's yeah, something yeah. That also, like it's like oh these metaphors are here and they're familiar tropes that we recognize in christian religion but also it's not like hey god is great like that's not the point of the story <laughs> no it's not and i think but i and i think like for for an american at that time it would be hard to write a story like this and not make it a jesus allegory like you couldn't because christianity Harry is so I mean, seeped into american um you know into american psyche it is yeah it's so i mean harry po i mean it's it's in west in western society in general yeah, I mean, harry potter's harry jesus potter too is, right is an allegory too and that's yeah. not even american Right, like, like there is, that's just how it is, but that's okay because this is purposeful with it, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, it's really good. So yeah, Trinity's awesome. She can then, trick my booty anytime. Every, every, uh, every hero, every hero and, and Jesus needs a Judas. Yeah. Um, so we are met with Cypher. Yeah. Uh, and so Cypher's, Cypher's name is Zero. So Cypher in, it's pronounced Cypher, S-I-F-R, -S I think is how you actually spell it. But in um, in uh, uh, Arabic, that's Zero. Also the key to a code is a Cypher. And he is, he is the one who is able to read the code. Like he has this amazing, I love that. He has this amazing like scene with uh, Neo, uh, when Neo has just awoken and has realized the matrix and is learning it for the first time he has this great interaction where he's just looking at the screen and he's reading all of the numbers. And he's just like, yeah, I can see that that's a woman in a red dress. I can see that that's that. And he's literally reading the computer code. Uh, mm -hmm. He is the key to the code because he's the person monitoring the most. Mm -hmm. um, but he is also the betrayer. 
Yeah. Uh, he is the the person who uh, has has finds this weight of faith too heavy and it has turned against it. So he chooses to betray the people for his ignorance. Yeah. Ignorance um, is bliss. Yes. And it's not bliss. even, so he, he is a representation of Judas, but he's also more, I think, lined to what we agreed was like Satan and Lucifer. Yeah, because it's cipher. It sounds kind of like Lucifer, right? That's not on accident. Um, yeah. He does, and he, he's there. To, he's there partly also to tempt Neo. You know, he's the one that introduces the idea to Neo of like, I know what you're thinking. Why didn't I just take the blue pill? And they cut over to Neo, and Keanu Reeves is like, No, fuck you. I wasn't thinking that. What the fuck are you talking about? And like, that's what his face says, right? He doesn't say that. He's, he's very nice. He's very nice. Neo is very nice to Cipher, but Keanu Reeves' face is like, The fuck? No, I wasn't. <laughs> But Cypher, you know, he he is very sympathetic towards that and, and of course eventually betrays them for that. And I think this is another thing. This is the same thing, same thing as what you said about how Morpheus is so good at the allegory that he's portraying. Cypher is so good at helping you understand the mindset of like what I would say is the stereotypical liberal in America. Somebody that like they they get it, they get the system sucks, but my god. God, this is so much work. Can't we just do a little bit here and there? You know, does it really have to be this whole thing where I have to unplug and eat this nasty slop every day? I just want to have my steak. Is this revolution mean I don't get to have my steak anymore? Because if it does, I'm just not sure I'm on board with it, guys. Like, that's Cypher. And it's so very clear. And like, when you meet him, it's like, oh, I get, I get why people might think that way. And I, I disagree with you a little as far as the liberal aspect. I think he's the everyman. I don't. Well, yeah, that's I don't, what I mean. Like, and yeah, I think most most think, Americans would say they're liberal. You know, and not even. No, I don't even think it's it's Americans. I think if faced with something this big, like self awareness in general, yeah. like I'm not even talking about like breaking the systems, but also breaking your trauma. How many people sit there and just have this moment of being like, I wish I could go back to not yeah, being yeah. aware of how A, messed up the world is, A, how messed up I am, how messed up this whole thing is, is that this crave for ignorance, this crave for disassociation. I think that that is the majority. That is the 95% yeah. of people given this choice. I think most of the people wouldn't even pick the red, the red pill to begin with. Um, and the people- Yeah, I don't do know if I would pick the red pill. I don't know. Do I want to go to a world where I eat slop and I have no internet? I don't know if I do. You know, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's that idea of, uh, I, like, I feel a lot for Cypher. Like, Cypher yeah. is obviously the villain in this, in this moment of betrayal, but I feel so much for him because he has for years. And there is this level of, if I could ignore it, why does it have to be me? Um, and that breaking under the weight of, of knowledge. Um, obviously, terrible person. <laughs> <laughs> Fucks them all over. Uh, yeah. But I understand it. And I think it is a human moment and part and a necessary part of the story because it shows us like how exceptional the other people who are a part of it are. Yeah. Um, that like Morpheus has to be as faithful as he is. Um, that Neo has to be as, as strong in his choices of finding free will as he is, that Trinity has to be the protector. She, the, she has to be in this role or else they might be Cypher. Mm -hmm. um, Cypher who didn't have a job except for seeing it as it was. Yeah, he had uh, a boring job. He just sat yeah. at the desk all day. He didn't have this higher power. Like he didn't have this higher faith. Yeah. um and and because well, he was, was because he was betrayed himself like he was pulled out saying you might be the one let's test you and see if you are oh it turns out you're not sorry get but here's a job you can just you can do this it's not nearly as cool as the job we told you we were gonna give you but it'll help you know <laughs> yes exactly and it's it's i i think that he is an amazing character for that reason obviously the actor is fan-fucking-tastic mm -hmm. um a steak scene so yeah. good. 
fake scene was so good and you just and also his whole like spiel and i don't know you, you i think it would be more of a soliloquy than a monologue um but as far as like when he's betraying them actively like mm-hmm. it's beautiful like it and it's well done and well preserved um but it is this it is this interesting just like juxtaposition of oh this is another role he is yeah. the betrayer he is the he is the person because at the end of the day he doesn't betray neo he portrays his he betrays as um sorry so he doesn't betray neo he betrays morpheus as yeah. as lucifer betrayed michael like He's it really is really mad I, at his at his dream daddy really mad at his dream daddy yeah <laughs> i mean and it's it's like this idea of being like oh you promised me this higher power and i am not capable of this level of faith that you are asking me of yeah. uh, which is very similar to what lucifer did with uh with god and michael (laughs) and and he and he was the one to fall so it was a it was an awesome he's just an awesome character um and and i want to do a little aside here okay so there's this fan theory about cypher that i want to touch on because i think it's really really funny so who knows who buck angel is I'll, i'll i'll get you can pause the video if you're watching on youtube and go google buck angel even if you don't know that name, you've probably seen Buck Angel before because he is the most well-known trans man porn star. So you probably have come across him, at least in memes. Buck Angel, unfortunately, not a very nice person. He's kind of a meanie, okay? So um, I don't, my husband said, oh my God, Does he, uh, he might know the fan theory that I'm, that I'm bringing up, but uh, uh, don't, just tell him to be quiet for a second. Let me explain it. Okay. <laughs> Mr. So Buck Angel, <laughs> yeah, be quiet, Mr. Kitty. <laughs> we'll get back. We'll get to it in a second. I but anyway, Buck Angel, so Buck Angel, <laughs> Buck Angel's not a very nice person. Okay, he's a trans medicalist, and without explaining what trans medicalist ideology is, because um, we don't have time to go into all of that, and you guys don't really care anyway. This is basically Buck Angel's take. You'll know this. Buck Angel is the kind of person that that says, you know, when I was a kid, I had to walk through the snow uphill both ways holding a hot potato in my hand to keep them warm and that was my lunch and we liked it okay this is this is buck angel feels this way and he feels like i went through all of this why are you people complaining you have it so much easier than i did my god shut up go through what i went through you know he's the kind of person that basically if he had it hard he believes it shaped him and everyone else should have it hard too okay so this is what buck angel did So, as Landon mentioned earlier, during the Matrix, the Wachowskis were not out as trans. Um, When they were doing the sequels, they were out to their friends, but not professionally yet, okay? So people knew that they were trans, like the cast and crew of the Matrix knew that they were trans, but the wider public did not. They're still credited as the Wachowski brothers in the Matrix sequels, even though by then they were the Wachowski sisters, okay? Um, Well, Buck Angel, in Rolling Stone, outs Lana Wachowski to the world. Now everyone knows that Lana Wachowski is a trans woman. Buck Angel's a jerk, okay? He's not a nice person. Um, So now there's this feud between Buck Angel and Lana Wachowski. Still to this day, you can find like um, tweets where they're bitching at each other, right? Because Buck Angel's such a freaking jerk. So there's this fan theory, there's this fan theory. Doesn't Cypher kind of look a lot like Buck Angel? <laughs> Doesn't maybe that was on purpose? Maybe because Lana Wachowski and Buck Angel hate them, hate each other so much. Um, you know, they uh, they made their villain look like Buck Angel. Wouldn't that be fun? Unfortunately, it's not true, guys. I'm sorry. Um, Lana Wachowski had not met Buck Angel by the point that they were writing or or filming The Matrix. Uh, this all happened after they met Buck Angel. Later, Buck Angel outed them later. Um, but wouldn't that be funny? Anyway, funny coincidence. The jerk in the movie looks like someone that Lana hates in real life for good reason. <laughs> Listen, it's a coincidence, I know, but just... I wish it was real. I wish it was real. <laughs> I want it to be real. <laughs> so funny. It is. It's so funny. funny. <laughs> so that's Cypher. We love him. We do love He's him. He's great. We don't love Buck Angel. <laughs> Angel. Let's talk I... about some other characters. Yes, other characters. Okay. Um, I know that you have a 
particular oh gosh i'm terrible yeah, for at me. switch for switch what, okay so we yes. want to mention i know we're almost to the end of the show but we wanted to mention a few other characters because i just wanted to show off how cool the wachowskis are when it comes to naming their characters so this character this is switch okay in the original script switch was trans that's why when switch dies inside the matrix they say not like this not like this what they were saying is they didn't want to die in their matrix body they wanted to die in their real body oh wouldn't that have been so cool well the producers didn't let the wachowskis do this so as a compromise that's why switch is so androgynous looking um that was the compromise no wachowskis you can't make switch trans but you can make them androgynous so I just wanted to wanted to mention that cool name. Next cool name. Apoc. Apoc's name is from the apocalypse, obviously. Apoc is the driver. Guess what? The four horsemen. He also later creates the four horsemen virus. He is also the red pill ejector. So if somebody takes the red pill, he's the one that goes and uh, fixes all their memories and stuff. So they think it was all a dream and not real or whatever. Cool <laughs> name, cool character. Tank and Dozer. They don't have cool names, but they're from the real world. <laughs> so that's why their names aren't like like synonymous with themselves, right? Like everybody that was that like adopts their own name, that chooses their own name, has a very meaningful name. Tank and Dozer, not super meaningful, but apparently in the future, people name their kids things like Tank and Dozer. <laughs> so that's funny. <clears throat> it is. Uh and also I like to appreciate that the only two people that we see from the material earth world uh are two people of color yeah, that's, that's nice, nice. Yeah. <laughs> and then because if you actually put yeah because if you actually put all the people together um white people are a minority in the world right so you know but yeah the last two du jour and choi so du jour is the girl that he follows that has the white rabbit tattoo so he so you know what neo is doing he's gonna go seize du jour he's gonna seize the day he's gonna follow follow the day cool name for like a tiny bit character they didn't have to give her such a cool name but they did they did the thing yep and then Choi this is the man he sells the disc to um there is a, a mathematical theorem that his name is taken from which is basically all about um uh positivity so that's cool if you want to if you want to find out some more about that google um Choi math you will find exactly what I'm talking about another cool fun name that you probably didn't notice when you were watching Okay, uh, we're at the end. We're at the end. And hey, we're doing really good on time, by the way. Well, about perfect. <laughs> it's, so, always, uh, it's always a hit or miss. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll ask you first, Landon, since this was a new movie for you, did it resonate? Yes, it obviously resonated. There's a lot of uh, interesting ideas of free will, especially the philosophy behind it. There's a lot of interesting uh, diversity that I really enjoyed. I think the story that I got from it, whether it was the intended story or not, is really, it was really important. Um, for me, I felt that it resonated. It does feel a little old because it is. <laughs> uh, like it is. And I'm not meaning that in a bad way, but technology itself has advanced. 20 years and I'm not even talking about like how movies are shot for how this movie is shot the special effects everything like that I that was beautiful I wasn't taken from that at all but I am I am incredibly curious what this movie could have been if I had watched it with my state of mind at that moment in time where I didn't have access to the idea of technology uh I wouldn't have felt lacking I feel a little lacking because of that and I recognize it's not the movie's fault uh, that's like what if you had watched this when you were like 10 or something, you know, yeah, or if I had watched it as a 20 year old when it was supposed to be when it was released, the truth, absolutely yeah. can yeah. be. I think that this would be the perfect movie. Um, but because I have experience of 20 years of technology after this, I do think that that would have changed how things could have interacted with the Matrix and also like just the idea of like where are we losing ourselves and, and all that kind of stuff yeah well because they and they go into the matrix via phones which like now okay. that seems a little hokey like why are they using a phone why wouldn't they use a computer you know um stuff like that and i think also one one small criticism you had of the of the movie because the script is so tight and it's so fast paced um you struggled to see chemistry between neo and trinity i think you had shared that with me when we first said which i think that's fair you know yeah, they kind of get not... together because they're the breeding pair there really isn't a good scene of chemistry for them 
in the first movie. I there this is not a love story for me there is nothing about this movie that screams chemistry or love story uh so in fact I like to forget that it existed um (laughs) you know uh, that was a major part of the movie (laughs) I it's not true love (laughs) that's my take on it I think the Wachowskis Uh, would disagree with you (laughs) that's fine show me more chemistry then (laughs) um maybe this well, you're gonna watch the sequels next so we'll see how you feel there because there is a lot more like trinity neo content in the sequels i don't know if you'll it'll necessarily narrowly change your mind i kind of don't think it will but there is more content of it hey if there's more like that was my number one thing that i was missing i was just like this seems out of nowhere <laughs> this seems like oh there has to be a romance because every single movie has a romance and, and that so is true the main character Oh, Landon's frozen. But I, but she, what she was about to say is, yes, they, Wachowski's probably cut this because that is kind of just, um, you know, it's what's expected. So they really didn't need to, uh, you know, develop it too much. Um, okay, so let's say, so did it resonate with me? Yes, of course. Oh my God, did it resonate with me. I freaking love this movie. I still love this movie. Um, it's excellent. It's one of my favorite movies. Um, I, I I love it now. I loved it then. I think it still speaks to a lot of the things that um, we experience now. And I know that it's it's really talking more about free will. It's not really talking about capitalism quite too much in this movie yet. Um, oh, hang on, you guys. Let me just turn that off. I think that was that was the Zoom crashing. Uh, let me see. Where is it at? I'm trying to find where I have the display. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I said too much. The Matrix crashed. <laughs> yep. Um, no worries, Landon. I'll turn you back on once you get back on. Oh but, God, uh, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. I turned I turned the display off. So once you get your screen back going, I'll make it so they can see you again. There we go. Okay. Um, let me turn you back on. There we go. No worries. I, I was just saying, eat, yes. I said too much. <laughs> you did. And the Matrix unplugged you and said, bye. Anyway, um, I, and I know that this particular, this first movie doesn't get too much into um, the pains that we experience in capitalism, things like that, but it clearly has those undertones. That's obviously part of what's going on. We will, you know, we'll see more in the sequels. We'll talk about those next week. But um, yes, this movie absolutely still resonates with me. I love it. I wouldn't change a damn thing about it. I don't really care if Neo and Trinity don't have chemistry because to me, the message is about what the Wachowskis are really saying is you should be doing what you can to make the lives, make people's lives better by focusing on your friends and family and those close to you. You know, what can you do to make your loved one's lives better? And if we spent more time focusing on that instead of focusing on like our class interests or the interests or interest based on um, on identity or interest based on political party, like the world would be better. And I do believe that's true. I do believe that's true. Um, it's much easier to say like, I wanna make the world better for Landon than for some like, I wanna make the world better for all the people in Maine, right? Like I'm sure the people in Maine are great, but I don't have a personal connection to them. <laughs> you know what i mean but if i make the world better for landon guess what the world is going to get better for everyone in maine not just landon because right? i have so much control uh- <laughs> <laughs> but it's true it's true so yes this movie still resonates i love it um i can't wait for the the fourth one that's coming out at the end of the month i can't wait i can't wait to see what the wachowskis do with this world um and how their philosophy is well lana's because only Lana's working on the this the fourth one. Uh, how Lana's philosophy and ideas have developed um, in the past couple of decades. So yeah, love it. I'm I'm yeah I'm excited for the sequels, which is funny because usually when I watch a movie like this, I'm not excited for the sequels. Yeah, it's like, like the sequels and... are gonna ruin it. <laughs> it's just like oh, it's a money grab, and like the first one was good and had a point, especially when it's something so philosophical, like philosophically. Oh my god, psycho psychologically and yeah. philosophically. Yeah deep and meaningful uh and makes a lot of money that tends to fall off in the sequels Mm -hmm. i have been told that that is not what happens so that probably has helped me look forward to the sequels but i am i am excited for the sequels and then we'll see how i feel about the fourth one Mm -hmm. i'm really interested to see what you think about the sequels um i will tell you they were not well received when they came out but in the years following 
people have decided, guess what? The sequels were good, actually, and you guys are dumb, which I actually agree with. Um, the sequels are good. When they came out, there were certain things about them that confused me, but overall I liked them, and I didn't really understand why everyone was hating so hard. Um, and my that opinion has been vindicated. <laughs> Oh, uh, thank you so much, Kitty. I mean, that's why we do them, because I get so much more out of them when I get a chance to talk with you guys about them. You know, it makes the movie more fun. It makes it more yeah. fun. I love being able to actually watch these movies. I'd never watch these movies if I didn't have to do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just good. It's good to it's good to enrich your media diet with lots of different mediums, you know? And I know this is a movie that's always been on my list. It's just not my typical go-to. I yeah like to watch the movies that I am comfortable with uh and you know for reasons Matrix makes me uncomfortable but that's good that was the point of it yeah it's supposed to if it doesn't make you a little uncomfortable you probably didn't understand what you were watching probably yep all right shall we wrap up yep let's wrap up so okay next week we already talked about we're gonna be talking about the sequels yeah, uh, I'm watching them this weekend. It's not going to be nearly as put together as this, but we will talk about the highlights and the lowlights and the things that we like, and maybe even the things that we're looking forward to in the fourth one, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, and we can also go off on Agent Smith and we can talk about more how Keanu Reeves is like really great in sunglasses yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> and all that fun stuff. Yep. Yep. So we're going to probably be talking about so some of the things you can look forward to is, um, you know, uh, the what 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 are the sequels actually doing that's different from the, the first movie? Because they are quite different in a lot of ways. You know, the Wachowskis got to do a little bit more of what they wanted to do because um, they were popular. And it was like, sure, yeah, that sounds crazy, but whatever, you know, <laughs> that happens with sequels. Um, Agent Smith is amazing in these sequels um hugo we you know where 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 we say things like you know lawrence fishburne was just like an excellent part of the first movie i feel like hugo weaving takes the cake in these sequels he is the best excellent performance best performance of the sequels so yeah we'll talk about that and um and yeah i definitely want to talk about what about like do we have any theories about what they're going to do with the fourth one like what do we think it's going to be so um so yeah you guys come with your uh fourth one theories two next you week do. <laughs> um yeah so yeah so, karen then, thank you oh oh yep so everybody can find me in all of the usual places um here are all of my socials and stuff there we go you can follow me in all the places um well i will also be streaming on thursday so on thursday we are finally going to beat final fantasy 10 so <gasps> if you would like to see oh me um destroy sin come come visit on thursday we are going to be doing that um for uh for the final the final final fantasy uh guess what after you beat the game there's more to it but <laughs> we will actually finally beat the game um and that's all the places you can find me landon where can we find you uh you can find me on instagram and twitter and then fun facts i got a new mic for my birthday thank you mom uh which means a special project might be coming out that i haven't even told karen about <gasps> so, what i get a uh, surprise is it my birthday <laughs> not your birthday it was my <laughs> birthday bitches that's true um, but i used to i used to uh before we did esw i really found uh love in editing podcast things and editing and talking into a mic and editing stuff um so there might be a uh, a little series that might appear on my twitter and instagram uh so i suggest you follow me at either of those places uh it'll be great oh okay fabulous <laughs> <laughs> all right so so that's it that's our show we will see you guys next week um saskatchewan is live so we're gonna go ahead and raid him he's playing satisfactory and it says all mm. xmas stuff all the time i love christmas and landon it's past your birthday now so i can shove christmas in your face <laughs> first christmas cheer i changed my name on the cert on the discord and everything i am very enthusiastic about christmas yes <laughs> <laughs> well you just no, tolerate it you tolerate it a little bit nicer it's by this point <laughs> tolerate. i just have 37 hours to spread throughout the entire month so I have to be very just careful with where I spread it. Some of it will be the Christmas village I put up this weekend. So stay tuned for photos of that too. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Kay. Thank you, Kitty. Thank you, Jed. Thank you, Kitty. We love doing Thank these Kay. episodes. So I really appreciate it. Okay, Thank you, Jed. here we go.
<laughs> all right guys we love all of our lurkers so thank you guys if you lurk during the stream we love all of our chatters too thank you for popping in in the chat um any sort of uh any sort of um you know engagement is good engagement whatever you want to do you're free to do that on interstage window all yeah. right of course yes we love you of course as always guys don't forget to make it a great day and don't forget to be awesome oh yeah okay here we go okay put on the sunglasses all right, guys. See you next week. Bye.